Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode we're going to discuss how South American monkeys reinvented color vision. So let's jump right in. <laughs> There was no tail to be found among these Cercopithecoids, the clade that includes colobines, langurs, vervets, and guenons, baboons, macaques, and all other extant monkeys found in Africa and Asia. Our common ancestor with these Cercopithecoids lived about 25 million years ago in the late Oligocene Epoch, and this is our first common ancestor we'll meet in the Paleogene. We share with these monkeys a narrow septum between down-facing nostrils and a bony ectotympanic tube. We also share a unique dental formula consisting of two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars in each quarter of the mouth. This means we have eight premolars in total, whereas other primates have 12. Unlike all the groups we've met previously, this is the first living group still to have external tails. Together, the ape clade Hominoidea and the clade Cercopithecoidea comprise the clade Caterini, the Old World Monkeys. Yes, we'll refer to all Caterines as Old World Monkeys, not exclusively to the Cercopithecoids, because here at Jackson Wheat Incorporated, we all adhere to cladistics. The common ancestor of Cercopithecoids probably looks something like Victoria Pithecus from 17 to 15 million years ago, and indeed the last common ancestor of Cercopithecoids is estimated to have lived about 14 million years ago. The last common ancestor of all Caterines may have looked something like Aegyptopithecus, which lived from 38 to 29.5 million years ago, or Epipliopithecus, which lived about 15.5 million years ago. Both were probably frugivorous. Moving back further, New World Monkeys, which is the clade Platyrrhini, join us 40 million years ago in the Eocene Epoch, and despite all modern Platyrrhines living in South America, our common ancestor likely lived in Africa. Caterines and Platyrines together comprise the clade Anthropoidea, or Simiaformes, and the members are often simply referred to as simians, meaning monkeys in Latin. At this point during the Eocene, the Earth is quite a bit different than today. Africa isn't attached to Asia, and the Isthmus of Panama has yet to join North and South America. Eurasia is divided by several seaways left over from the Mesozoic era, and Australia is just beginning its slow pull northward away from Antarctica. The position of the continents has a major impact on the Earth's climate. When North and South America were separate, the ocean currents went through this Central American seaway, exchanging waters directly between the Pacific and Atlantic. But when the Isthmus of Panama formed about 3 million years ago, the Pacific and Atlantic were cut off from each other, and the ocean currents were redirected. One of these new currents went far north, reaching very high latitudes. Today this is known as the Gulf Stream, which transports heat from the equator to western Eurasia, thereby making it more temperate. Additionally, as the warm water of the Gulf Stream evaporated, the air of the northern hemisphere gained a lot more moisture, which increased precipitation. At such high latitudes, this also meant a lot more snow as well. So much snow that not all of it melted away during the summer, despite the extra warmth provided by the Gulf Stream. This led to the formation of permanent ice sheets of the northern hemisphere, initiating the Quaternary Glaciation, aka the Ice Age. In the southern hemisphere, there is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which flows eastward and continuously flows around Antarctica, as there are no land masses in the way. Since these currents do not reach warmer equatorial regions, the water of this current remains extremely cold. So cold that ice fish have evolved antifreeze proteins that prevent them from freezing up solid. Around 34 million years ago, the Tasmanian and Drake passages were formed that isolated Antarctica, which led to the Circumpolar Current, and the subsequent glaciation of the southern hemisphere. However, going back to the Eocene, Antarctica was still loosely connected to South America and Australia, so this current did not yet exist. The world is a lot warmer, wetter, and there are no permanent polar ice caps. There are far fewer open grasslands, but much more extensive forests. South America was also a lot closer to Africa, being 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers, or 932 to 1,242 miles, apart, 
instead of today's 2,574 kilometers, or 1,600 miles apart. And as we pointed out in our video, A Critique of Intelligent Design Part 1, this facilitated the rafting of stem platyrines to South America. This may still seem unlikely. Indeed, when thrown adrift at sea by a storm, a landslide, or tsunami, practically no one will survive and reach another continent. However, we need to remember the scale of time that we are dealing with. Such an event is extremely unlikely to occur within a single lifetime, but within periods of many millions of years, extremely unlikely events are bound to happen at least a few times. Indeed, around 40 million years ago, a small band of monkeys hitched a ride, likely on some floating vegetation, across the much thinner Atlantic. The earliest fossil platyrine is Perupithecus, dated to 35 million years ago. Other small mammals did the same. All South American rodents of the parv order Caviamorpha, including New World porcupines, which aren't closely related to African porcupines, agoutis, capybaras, guinea pigs, chinchillas, spiny rats, and the massive extinct Phoboromis, are also descended from ancestors who survived a single rafting event from Africa between 43 and 38 million years ago. There is actually a twist to this rafting tale that was unveiled in 2020. The twist comes in the form of some teeth from Peru dating to 31.7 million years ago designated Eukaea lepithecus perdita. Eukaea lepithecus nests deeply within the African parapithecid family, a clade of stem anthropoids, meaning that relatives of this primate rafted independently to South America around the same time the ancestors of platyrines did. How many other times did primates raft to South America, but remain unknown to us because their teeth didn't end up in a paleontologist's shelf and their lines faded away before zoologists could get a chance to study them? As for the platyrines themselves, there are five families. Calatricidae, the marmosets and tamarins, Cebidae, the capuchins and squirrel monkeys, Aotidae, the owl monkeys, Pithecidae, the titis, sakis, and wakaris, and Atelidae, the howler, spider, and woolly monkeys. Within these families are a total of 20 genera and 156 species. Though platyrines may look similar to these cercopithecoids, there are some important morphological differences between them. Platyrines have rounded, widely spaced, sideways facing nostrils, prehensile tails, which evolved in Cebidae and Atelidae independently, 12 premolars instead of 8, are small and typically arboreal, and often form monogamous pair bonds. Interestingly, prehensile tails have evolved in several other South American animals kinkajous, porcupines, tree anteaters, opossums, and the salamander Bolidoglossa. Outside of South America, this feature has also evolved in pangolins, some tree rats, skinks, chameleons, and seahorses. And like the gibbons we met in the previous tale, platyrines vary extensively in their chromosomal count, from as few as 16 in the TT monkey to as many as 62 in the woolly monkey. Among many other characteristics, platyrines and catarines share some peculiar attributes related to their vision. All anthropoids have a post-orbital plate that fully separates the eyes from the jaw muscles behind the eye sockets. They also have a spot at the center of the retina called the fovea centralis, which is specialized for producing high-resolution images at the center of vision. Anthropoids also tend to be more diurnal, meaning they are more active during the day than other primates, although there are exceptions. Related to this, and of interest to us today though, is color vision. In your retina are neuroepithelial cells called photoreceptors. In mammals, there are three types, rods, cones, and intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGCs. Rods are extremely sensitive photoreceptors, being able to detect even a single photon. They are almost entirely responsible for night vision, but function very little in color vision. By contrast, cones are responsible for color vision, and we shall return to them shortly. Lastly, IPRGCs were hinted at as early as the 1920s, but research on them didn't really start until the 1980s. Researchers found that the circadian rhythm in rats was regulated by light even in the near absence of rods and cones, but their spectral sensitivity, or the relative efficiency of light detection as a function of the wavelength of the signal, was unlike that of rods and cones. In other words, the mystery photoreceptors were most sensitive to light wavelengths different from rods and cones, and, indeed, IPRGCs appear to be most sensitive to turquoise light, around 480 nanometers. 
Additionally, quote, newborn mice, which had yet to develop rods and cones, were found to show photic activation of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the master circadian pacemaker, suggesting that the retina was already feeding light signals into the retinohypothalamic tract, close quote. Further, researchers found that 1-2% to of retinal ganglion cells project into the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that these indeed function as photoreceptors. These became known as IPRGCs. Intriguingly, these photoreceptors operate unlike rods and cones, the two vertebrate photoreceptor cell types, but convergently like the photoreceptor cells of invertebrates. That is, these cells depolarize when excited rather than hyperpolarize. This requires a bit of explanation. Understand that vision is a series of chemical reactions stimulated by light. The light-sensitive proteins, also known as photopigments, involved in this process are called opsins. Rods have rhodopsin, cones have photopsin, and IPRGCs have melanopsin. Opsins encase a single retinaldehyde molecule, which is itself derived from vitamin A. The retinaldehyde molecule is kinked to fit inside the opsin, but when a photon hits the retinaldehyde, the kink straightens out. Through a series of molecular steps, this causes potassium ions, which are positively charged, to be pumped to the outside of the photoreceptor, a process called hyperpolarization. As a result, the neurotransmitter glutamate is no longer released from the photoreceptor, causing the attached retinal bipolar cell to depolarize, or pump its sodium ions, which are negatively charged, out of the cell. This excites an amacrine cell, which sends a signal to the ganglion cells, which ultimately sends a signal to the brain. With the nuts and bolts of photoreception down, how did the system evolve and what do howler monkeys have to do with it? We share with Agnatha, or the jawless fish, together the extant lampreys and hagfish, a common ancestor that lived about 525 million years ago in the early Cambrian. Our common ancestor with these fish had five cone pigment genes, making them pentachromatic, each encoding a classical visual opsin. Middle wavelength sensitive rhodopsin like one, the rod rhodopsin, middle wavelength sensitive rhodopsin like two, a cone photopsin, short wavelength sensitive opsins 1 and 2, and long wavelength sensitive opsin, another cone photopsin. Opsins are themselves duplicated from previously existing G-protein coupled receptors, which is a large class of cell surface molecules that detects and responds to stimuli. This gene family arose prior to the origin of Opus thecanta, the clade that includes fungi and animals. Successive rounds of G-protein coupled receptor gene duplications have also led to neuropsin, pinopsin, and melanopsin, among others. G-protein coupled receptors in turn may have even evolved from prokaryotic rhodopsins that pump ions by using the energy of photons, such as the bacteria rhodopsin of halophilic archaea that use light energy to produce a proton gradient, which in turn powers ATP synthase. Now we can finally get to the cones. For reference, there are three types of cationine cone cells, which we typically call red, green, and blue, or long, middle, and short wavelength, respectively. We'll stick with the color names, even though they can be a bit confusing. Red cones are most sensitive to light wavelengths around 575 nanometers, green cones 535 nanometers, and blue cones 445 nanometers. Unfortunately, these names don't directly correspond to the wavelengths of light for which they're named. For humans, red cones peak in their sensitivity in yellowish-orange light rather than red, and blue peaks in purplish-blue. However, these are close enough that they'll suffice for our purposes. Sauropsids, the lizards, turtles, crocodilians, and birds, typically have very good color vision, and it is likely that our distant synapsid ancestors also had decent color vision. However, that changed in the Mesozoic. Dinosaurs ascended to dominance across the planet, and our tiny, shrew-like ancestors were restricted to the night, called the nocturnal bottleneck. Of course, you don't really need color vision at night, so mammals lost rhodopsin-like 2 and shortwave-sensitive opsin-2. Rhodopsin-like 1, as mentioned previously, is expressed in our rod cells, and shortwave-sensitive opsin-1 and longwave-sensitive opsin are expressed in our cone cells. In most mammals, shortwave sensitive opsin 1 peaks in violet to blue wavelengths, like in us, making it homologous to our blue cone photopigment, and longwave sensitive opsin peaks from green to red. Prior to the common ancestor of all cationine primates, a gene duplication occurred, so now we have two copies of longwave sensitive opsin, 
One copy became the green cone pigment, and one became the red cone pigment. Marsupials, too, have an interesting situation. Like most mammals, most marsupials are dichromatic. They just have the blue and green to red opsins. However, the Australian quokka, southern brown bandicoot, honey possum, and fat-tailed dunnart have been shown to possess trichromatic vision. Evidently, these marsupials have cones that express a photopigment in 20-25% to of their cone cells that is similar in spectral sensitivity to rod rhodopsin. And further, the dunnart has two copies of the rhodopsin-like one gene. Regardless of the exact genetic reason, trichromacy must have evolved at least twice in marsupials. It is not known why this feature exists in some Australian marsupials, but not others, like the tamar wallaby. Now we come to the strange case of the platyrrhines. Set aside the howler monkeys for the moment, we'll come back to them. Also set aside the monochromatic owl monkeys, for obvious reasons. The gene for the blue opsin is located on chromosome 7. Everyone has it. But the gene for the green to red opsin, our separate red and green opsins, is on the X chromosome. Recall that females have two X chromosomes, but males have just one. As a result, a female has the potential to receive two different alleles of the green to red opsin, but males can only receive one. A female platyrrhine could receive a green to red allele that peaks in the red on one X chromosome, and a green to red allele that peaks in the green on the other chromosome. Therefore, the female would essentially have blue, green, and red cones. She would be trichromatic. Males, by contrast, could only ever be dichromatic since they only receive one green to red allele. So the male platyrrhines will be colorblind, but not all in the same way. Some will lack green opsins and some will lack red opsins. This is the case for tamarins and squirrel monkeys. Why then do these polymorphisms persist in these species? There are two explanations, frequency dependent selection and heterozygote advantage. The former is the idea that the fitness of an allele relates to its frequency within a population. For instance, imagine that the green opsin predominates in the population. Monkeys with only the green opsin can only see green fruit, and this leads them to all eat the green fruit in an area. As a result, more monkeys with only the green opsin will start to starve because the green fruit has been eaten. However, a few monkeys will, by chance, have the red opsin and they will be able to eat the red fruits that have been ignored by everyone else. As monkeys with green opsins decrease in population due to starvation, monkeys with red opsins will increase and then the cycle will start again. Heterozygote advantage, on the other hand, is when individuals who are heterozygous at a locus are fitter than individuals who are homozygous at a locus. The classic example of this is sickle cell anemia in Africa. Individuals who are homozygous for the sickle cell allele suffer from anemia, but individuals who have just one copy of the sickle cell allele do not have anemia and are protected from malaria. Agriculture in Africa has resulted in a lot of standing water, which is a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Thus, the sickle cell allele persists because its benefit in those areas outweighs its downsides. Now we come to the howler monkey. They are trichromatic due to a translocation. Instead of having just one opsin allele on the X chromosome, recombination occurred between two X chromosomes in an ancestral female howler monkey that resulted in both opsin alleles ending up on the same chromosome. Fortunately, the individual was heterozygous for that locus possessing both a green and red opsin allele, and so was trichromatic. Now, all howler monkeys are trichromatic as a result, even the males. So, that's the howler monkey's tail. Trichromacy has evolved several times through different roots in mammals, and the long, complicated history of opsin genes is recorded within vertebrate genomes. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.